here at this university about which I heard so much through the years and which uh, prepared me at one of the high points of my life yesterday, giving me honorary doctorate. Um, um, I have several major topics I talk about, but then Jeff and I discuss what to discuss. And uh, uh, I sometimes take one, for example, networks of rail transit, sometimes I'm talking about the policies of urban transportation and so on. When I find a region like this one, which has so many people interested in the field, then I'm really tempted which topic to take. <laughs> so we agreed we would talk about medium capacity transit modes, uh, which is uh, toward the project that you have here, focusing on, on your uh, plans. Uh, but uh, I will try to include also bigger pictures because, uh, as I mentioned yesterday in my speech there, um, that we need a systems approach in urban transportation, that we are really not talking only about an efficient light rail or an efficient public transit. We're talking about livable cities. We're talking about your whole uh, region here and how that will affect, how that will benefit from the project. So. Um, I will try to also put some comments about the whole uh, urban uh, situation and trends. So let me start. Um, I will describe in the beginning uh, the bus dominance of many countries and uh, some misconceptions that happened. Uh, and uh, I'm talking about the changes that happened after World War II, especially in North America when people began to, the car ownership rapidly increased. What happened then with the urban transportation policies and understanding of that or lack of understanding of what the problems are. There were discussions at that time how to change modes of transportation um, and, uh, and how that uh, developed, how we eliminated or destroyed streetcars in most cities uh, but then what happened with, uh, with that situation and how later uh, these medium capacity systems got developed. So in these uh, uh, points uh, uh, up to five, we're talking about buses, uh, point six is light rail transit, and then I will include also some other medium capacity systems, even such as automated guided transit and the PRT concept and monorails. Um, what happened uh, when the car ownership increased uh, rapidly in the 1940s, 50s, and so on, uh, was that uh, trams or streetcars were not maintained very well uh, for a long time, and then they were proclaimed to be noisy and old-fashioned, and we are now on the highways, and uh, with the cars and highways, you can travel anywhere to any place at any time except when too many people did that, then nobody could move because we develop congestion in cities. Um, so, uh, the, uh, many cities then abandoned uh, streetcars completely and they went to buses. A few cities in North America uh, had rapid transit and then uh, uh, some other cities began to build uh, rapid transit systems. Toronto was the first one after World War II with a new uh, rapid transit system. So, um, buses are now the most common mode of transportation in most cities because they require low investment, they can be placed easily on any street, they require very little infrastructure, uh, but on the other hand, that low infrastructure is, is a negative side because it doesn't give the image and permanence and quality of service that rail systems do. Uh, also, the buses have low economies of scale. If you have a larger volume of passengers in rail, you just have more trains and longer, longer trains and productivity of the driver increases greatly. With buses, we cannot for every bus load, we have one more driver and so on. Um, so the buses are satisfying many needs, but uh, it's uh, 
it's important to notice that uh, there are many variations of buses and then also what are the relationships with other modes and uh, which other modes we need. At that time, 1950 to 1970, there were several way, uh, lines of thought and one theory was in very large cities, if you have a metro, if you have a metro or subway, rapid transit, then you need only buses on surface. So the two modes is the most efficient and that's all you need. Um, that proved to be wrong. In uh, very large cities, um, you usually do not have a metro system which has a dense network and then you need only a few buses to cover the surface. Large cities need, in most cases, also medium capacity modes. And uh, uh, at that time, New York ended up with subway and buses. Chicago, the same. Uh, London, the same. Paris, the same, and so on. The arguments for buses came then, and the uh, the concept was promoted that buses are flexible and therefore they fit better into mixed train traffic. Now that was a drastic mistake. Uh, as the traffic increased in streets, many cities had separate uh, streetcar or tramway or so-called right-of-way B, which is separated from traffic, although it goes across intersections, but it's not it's mostly separated. Well, then came the wave to say that uh, we really should pave those tracks to increase capacity. You don't increase capacity if you replace uh, streetcars where one or two or three cars carry 300 people by vehicles which carry 1.3 persons. Mm -hmm. So you really, by paving those two tracks, you are greatly decreasing capacity Plus, you are decreasing the level of service and making transit completely in, uh, non, non competitive with the car. You cannot compete by transit with the cars in the same mixed traffic because you are going the same, lower speed because of stops and there is no, uh, it's just less convenient. So, this. Uh, discussion of this flexibility. Flexibility is a nice word. It sounds like then you can do anything. I, I had so much problems with that debate and with some, even one professor I had in California, that I wrote a detailed article, Concept of Flexibility in Transportation. And I said, flexibility means ease of change, but is that always positive? In some cases, we want to be able to change something. But in some cases, we want the opposite. The opposite of flexibility is permanence, durability, efficiency, quality of service. All of these are decreasing if you're increasing flexibility. So what happened in, specifically in the cities was that they replaced streetcars by buses and gave up that right of way. That was a basic mistake. Um, that happened, as I said, in most cities and in entire Britain virtually. Streetcars disappeared. France abandoned. Franco in Spain said no more streetcars. The uh, United States abandoned them in nearly all cities except where we have them in tunnels like Boston and Philadelphia and so on. Um, <coughs> so uh, that. Uh, that uh, trend went on, but some other countries had better view of that. The Europeans, and, and there was a group of German experts who came to visit the United States, and they saw how the situation is, and they came back and they said, we do not want that flexibility and that abandoning and, and mixing <coughs> transit with cars. We want to increase separation and make them independent. That means we want more separated ways. 
and they said we can do that better by rail systems than by buses. So they gradually but systematically increased the separation of rights of way, put tracks separately, sometimes even for two, three kilometers in center city, tunnel. But it's also expensive, like rapid transit, but it, it, it can come out of the tunnel as soon as it's not in the very the center and then run on the surface on that separate right of way, which is much cheaper. So that developed what we now call light rail transit because that new mode, which is mostly separated, which became physically long vehicles, high capacity, extremely quiet, electrified, and so on, uh, that mode began to be more similar to the metro or subway than to the old streetcar. And that's why we introduced the term light rail, or in Germany it's called Stadtbahn, and so on. So there were two streams, really. Some countries were developing light rail and uh, medium capacity system, uh, and that was in Netherlands, Germany, uh, Belgium, Austria, and some other cities like Melbourne in Australia, and, and, uh, and the Soviet cities, and so on. Um, that is... Uh, uh, so the two streams went, and uh, the U.S. was still saying streetcars are old and noisy and so on. That was greatly helped by the lobbies of highways, lobbies of automobile manufacturers, uh, lobbies of oil companies and rubber tire companies. Uh, the uh, consultants were producing reports, future highways and urban growth, where they found that the freeway system, freeways as many as possible, is really has all the benefits the whole report like this is only benefits from building an interstate system through all the cities and into downtowns and so on automobilization of cities we came late 60s we came to a, 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 a change of mind it started in san francisco when they were planning an eight-lane freeway through golden gate park and then people come out and said, we don't want to leave, live in loops of interchanges of highways. And that was a freeway rebellion. And then uh, in the early 70s, many, many cities looked at their freeway plans that looked like Los Angeles and, and Detroit. And they abandoned most of those freeways. My Philadelphia, fortunately, was late in building all these freeways. So we abandoned a lot of them. Otherwise, Philadelphia would have become uh, Los Angelesized and, and changed. Um, back to our transit. There was also some theory that people who have cars will not transfer between transit lines. So really, we have these flexible buses, again flexible. So we should really use buses with many lines going through many streets. And there was a trend of making really dense network of very low quality services. Every, on every line, the bus is running every 20 minutes, 30 minutes or so. It's slow, it's stopping in every corner and so on to, minim to try to copy the private automobile and, uh, and uh, uh, thereby uh, serve these areas, but it does not compete with the automobile if it runs every 20 minutes and it's very slow. So that uh, in many cities we have, like in Seattle and many others, we have 150, 200, 250 bus lines going everywhere. But transferring between those two lines, uh, any lines, is virtually impossible if each one is running every 10, 15, 20 minutes. So that uh, that theory was wrong, and it was noticed that a very extensive network with low quality of service is not the way to compete with the automobile. You need to focus on more major arterials, or fewer, uh, fewer major arterials, and interconnect them into a network and make transfers convenient. And that we have proved, as I'll show, that people will gladly transfer if they have a faster way of traveling. 
in these lines which have higher frequency, higher speed, and good uh, nodes for transferring, they have attracted many more passengers than those dispersed hundreds of bus lines. I was in uh, Buenos Aires once. They have uh, over a thousand bus lines, and I said, how do you find out which bus do you take? Oh, yes, yes, we have a book. They have a book <laughs> like this. It would take me, uh, you know, two hours to learn how to go. I, I could walk at that time. <laughs> so it's a really <coughs> misunderstanding of how people behave and, uh, and, and, and transfer, if it's well planned, is not a great obstacle. We try to avoid two or three transfers, of course. But one transfer is, if it's good, is, is very gladly taken and, and uh, uh, successful. Then there was also passengers prefer frequent stops, and especially the bus in the curb lane, when you can easily stop it anywhere. <laughs> so in cities like my Philadelphia, we still have buses stopping at every corner, like in 1920s. It's incredible how old-fashioned New York needed a campaign of many years to introduce at least two blocks between stops. So we remain with these old-fashioned view of creeping buses which are flexible but not attractive to anybody. Now, what happened then with these two modes per city uh, is that uh, most, of, most of the traffic, most of the services were, were buses on streets which require low investment. This is the investment. Do you see that? Is that yeah. This is the investment. So you have low investment for buses, but you also have low quality of service and speed and reliability. Then many cities, like Pittsburgh and Buffalo and Ottawa and so on, they need something better than these slow buses on streets. What was the alternative? Metro. Well, Metro is nice. It's much better service. It is much better service, but uh, much better service, but much higher investment. So, for cities which are not very large, we need really something that is much better than this, but lower cost than this. We have this gap in between, which are really these medium capacity systems. So, uh, this gap between the two modes uh, really left cities without much selection. Uh, lost separation made it difficult, and then the uh, cities which adopted light rail systems, they, uh, they found the good solution to put uh, uh, light rail systems as medium capacity, much higher quality than buses on streets and uh, much lower cost than rapid transit. So, uh, uh, we have also, in introducing light rail transit, we also reduced the number of stops and speeded it up and, and made a much higher quality of service and good transfers. So, where do we use these medium capacity cities, uh, uh, modes? And by the way, this uh, discussion about economy of scale, that if you have a metro and a bus, then you should not really have more modes, the trolley buses and, uh, and some uh, uh, regional rail and so on. Now we look at around the country, and really it is simpler if you have only two modes. But if you look, uh, the uh, cities which have good transit in North America, you see that most of them have a great number of different modes. So from economic point of view, it may be more complicated, but they certainly are much more attractive to passengers, which are these cities. San Francisco has regional BART, it has Muni, it has cable car, it has bus, it has trolley bus, and so on. So uh, uh, Boston has several modes. Toronto has several modes. Uh, so that these different modes 
I really very often uh, have great advantage in providing better service, uh, maybe at higher cost, but also stronger support by the population to have such high quality of service. Uh, now, the need for these medium side, medium capacity modes, sorry. yeah, the mode, uh, the, the, the need for that uh, focused on this area, and this is where first light rail transit came, and we didn't have to invent it because uh, light rail transit was already very well known in Europe. So that in 1975, we got together and said, let's organize the conference on light rail transit to define what that is. And we had a conference in Philadelphia with a great interest. And what have we achieved? Well, first of all, several years passed and no city is doing it. And we, we were nervous what, what's going on. Then came uh, the first modern light rail transit in North America. Which one was that? Edmonton. Edmonton followed by, Cal by uh, San Diego, and then uh, Calgary and Edmonton were competing, and it's usually healthy. They, they both do well then. <laughs> and Calgary is now one of the biggest on the continent. Uh, so today we have, uh, we have new light rail systems in those two, and in Vancouver, and Vancouver is one of the automated medium capacity systems, and, uh, and Ottawa is now going there. And, and in America, there are about 20 cities, over 20 cities, which have either drastically renovated old systems, like Boston, uh, and uh, cities which uh, which just build new systems like San Diego, Los Angeles is building line after line trying to recover its automobilization and its a really bad situation with respect to transit. Uh, so that we have been very successful in that. In addition to that came uh, buses, which I was always arguing, if it's a bus, it can go anywhere, it can stop anywhere, it should not go anywhere and stop everywhere. It should be faster. So we began to slowly notice that uh, we should have separated <coughs> lanes. Now we rediscovered transit lanes which we destroyed when we invented streetcars. The buses came with the new lanes and with upgrading and so on. And upgrading came also to uh, uh, to several systems which did some improvements with very good results, like in uh, Los Angeles there is a bus line on Wilshire Boulevard, we just had stops, many fewer stops, about four, four blocks instead of one and so on. It has uh, newly painted buses, it has some uh, benefits at stations and so on, uh, and uh, it increased ridership by 20-30%. Uh, BRT came then as a bus rapid transit concept. Now the name is wrong, rapid transit should be the one that is totally independent. This is semi-rapid transit, but popular name is BRT, so we call it BRT now. Uh, and BRT got built in many cities and uh, has been very successful in many developing countries. Uh, and uh, it has been built in several of our cities in North America. I will get into that right now to explain the advantages and disadvantages of bus rapid transit and light rail transit and then cover some of the modes. Um, in looking at buses, the way they are operated, some of them just creeping in every block, that's the standard bus. I was always claiming this, we could do better even by these buses, by better boarding, better lighting, better fare collection, rather than everybody pushing in the doors and so on, better information, better transfers and so on. So I call bus transit system one which is existing once, but just better organized and better operated. And then comes bus rapid transit. Now strictly, if we define bus rapid transit with six different items like separate way, long 
long spacings uh, between stations, uh, off vehicle fare collection, signal priorities, uh, and special vehicles, and so on. There are not that many systems which are that, but uh, in, in developing countries there are. Uh, and um, uh, there is some mixture now, what is called, you, you make some small speeding up and they call it BRT. Well, whatever it is, we are now improving buses more than we used to, 10, 20 years ago. Generally, our bus services were just really very poor, poorly organized. Now we see that the more elements of rail transit that we take to buses, the better they are. And that means fewer lines, high frequency, offline stations, and so on. Uh, this BRT is also uh, developed in Europe under different name, bus service with high level of service, BHS, LS. There are trials to define what is BRT, what's BHLS, they're more or less the same. Uh, now, what are the characteristics of that BRT or that? It's, uh, it's uh, buses which may be standard or articulated or double articulated in some cases. Floor heights may be regular floor and then high platforms or low floor and so on. Doors can be on the right hand side as usual or on the left hand side but in that case you have to have a platform uh, in the median and the bus has to come somewhat slower to uh, stop at that station and uh, uh, you cannot then have those buses branch into many lines because they have to have such stations on the so-called wrong side platform and every street. So it's basically only the shuttle on the main line. So the BRT is really in many concepts very similar to rail systems. Uh, the uh, uh, the uh, speeding up of uh, the uh, advantage, the time uh, advantage of uh, at signals, the activation of signals and priority of, uh, for buses and signals is also a very good thing and it's a very useful thing, but in many cities, it's not done in many cities because it is complicated and it's a problem how, how you handle then the other traffic and so on. It's somewhat disappointing that we don't have those, that actuation and it is more difficult than, than for rail, where we have now light rail systems where uh, when the, the train comes toward the signal, it automatically gets green and, and goes through green and doesn't have any uh, delay. Um, now, the bus improvements, uh, one problem of bus improvements is that uh, it needs uh, police enforcement and in many cities like in Boston if you talk about discipline in Boston everybody laughs at you uh, because uh, in Boston they have one uh, uh, BRT there where in winter they push snow onto that lane because that's where you can store it uh, the police doesn't do anything or, and the policemen who are doing it are not competent and don't know how to do it and so on so we have a uh, we have that limitation, uh, and uh, we have to prevent cars from coming in and going out. That coming in and going out has been solved by a very simple solution. Mexico City uses it. They put just small curbs along the way, which you could even drive over, but when it's there, you don't have the illegal driving in. So that's that's one step forward. Uh, the uh, uh, BRT very often, usually, is lower cost than light rail. It's not always drastically lower cost, it depends on the situation. Uh, in uh, some developing countries, like in Brazil, they have the control of the streets and highways and they can do it. We uh, don't have that quite so good in, in our cities and uh, we have another big obstacle in the United States and that's the highway lobby. 
because you get a special lane and then there is a suggestion, well, yeah, but off peaks we, we can use that for other traffic. And then uh, you say the, the bus lane is only from 6.30 to 9.30 and from 4 to 6 and the in-between it is not that. You change the whole image of of BRT system. And then came, uh, we, we had several BRT really systems in Washington, Los Angeles and so on. And then came the idea that uh, uh, that should be an HOV lane, high occupancy vehicle. And uh, if you have four or more passengers in that in their car, you're allowed to use the bus lane. And then, of course, some uh, uh, suggestion comes, well, you know, it's not completely four. Maybe we could go with three or more. And then finally, in Minneapolis, they proclaim all HOV lanes are two or more. So you're downgrading step by step. And you really don't have a system. You don't have system image, you don't have system effect. So we lost in the United States a number of those busways or BRTs from 1970s and 80s. Uh, it becomes even more drastic. And that is that uh, uh, sometimes you have this bus lane and uh, at some places uh, some people are asking for right turns from that lane and it goes to the city council. And city council then votes, and they get phone calls and so on. And the city council can come, and we come as transportation engineers and show how much more efficient it is. No, but their neighbors want something else. So we get that the total laymen, like councilmen, are voting to downplay and destroy our system. And that has happened in my Philadelphia and many other places. Uh, there was a court case in Los Angeles where the court said that you're not, a, you cannot just uh, separate a lane for buses only, you have to allow other vehicles. So the court judge, who knows nothing about transportation, destroyed the whole concept. This is what does not happen in Brazil and many other countries, but we, we really have that problem. Um, so, we have, uh, uh, with BRT, great successes in many cities. In Sao Paulo, in Bogota, good planning, land use planning with that and so on. Um, uh, BRT is also successful in some cities like Eugene, Oregon, which is not big enough for rail system investment, but they really did a very nice uh, uh, bus system. In many, in some, not many, but French, Spanish and British cities, there are some special roadways and so on. This, the biggest setback for that was the HOV concept, which is only in our country, in the United States. Other countries don't have that concept of HOV. HOV in California was voted by the California legislature in Sacramento for a case in Los Angeles. And when they let reduce the number of persons per car, the whole uh, El Monte busway collapsed it was all congested and really destroyed. So we have that problem. We, so uh, in many cities, they are sex and BRT is very successful. In some, it is not and depends on local conditions. What about light rail transit? Well, there has been a great diversity of developments because light rail can really go uh, through city streets. It can go on one side to uh, very long distances with high speed and sometimes even if it's a long distance it can be 100, 120 kilometers per hour maximum speed. Usually it's 50, 60 kilometers per hour. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, the, uh, uh, on the other side it can go through a pedestrian zone and it, in recent decades Many cities which plan short tunnels in center city have given up on that and said, let's make it a pedestrian zone and run a light rail through that zone. So in that one or two kilometers, you do go slower, but you bring people also closer. Like Calgary did not build the tunnel. Edmonton did. Calgary did not. And they, they like it and uh, it's adequate because uh, it's, it's a transit street only. Uh, 
Um, there's a great variety of light rail transit systems by speed, by capacity, by uh, alignment. And then on the upper side, if you fully separate tracks, then you can operate also automatically. And that has been done in Vancouver very successfully. And uh, uh, what's the advantage of having fully automated? Well, then you, you, can, uh, you can have trains of two or three or four cars, but in off-peak you separate them into, small, into smaller units and you operate them every two, three minutes without any extra cost because you don't have more drivers. So this, and again, Vancouver is one of the world's best cases which has shown how that works. And then there is tram-train concept which means uh, that you take light rail and then you go to a railway track between cities and you can go to suburbs and uh, there, Karlsruhe, German was the first one, but now there are about a dozen cities in, in mostly in Europe where there is that combination of light rail in the city and going out in regional lines into the suburbs with ridership multiplying two, three, four times what it used to be. So the light rail has now train capacities of 100 to even 800 spaces. Um, the floor uh, has changed from standard floor to low floor, although there are some combinations in this 100% low floor is very popular and politically city after city are buying that. But mechanically and operationally, the uh, system of so-called 70% low floor, which means low floor in the middle with the doors for handicapped and so on, easy there and so on. But then you have a couple of steps and you go up to the upper floor and there you have the uh, standard bogies and motors and much simpler mechanically and much more rugged and much more economical. Houston has such a vehicle and Cologne has such a vehicle. Anyway, there is a fantastic diversity of types of vehicles that are being used. Uh, the ways can be so-called right-of-way category B, which is mostly separated, like yours will be mostly B. Some C, if you run through the streets or pedestrian areas, or A, which is fully separated. So you can, on one line, you can use all of these uh, types of rights of way. Uh, speed, as I mentioned, uh, in, uh, in cities like, uh, uh, like uh, Dallas, Texas, which, by the way, the first reaction from Texas was, oh, we, we drive cars, we are Texans, we are, we are free people. So nobody will use that rail system, that, that Soviet maybe, or something like that. <laughs> the uh, Dallas line has been so successful that in one area where they didn't want a station because they didn't want those people to come, they don't say what they mean by those, but we know what they mean. <laughs> so they had to build a tunnel and spend a few hundred million dollars. When they open up the line, the line collected not only many riders, but I have a photograph where there is a, there is, there is uh, workers, there are students, there are tourists, there are businessmen, with everybody. So the image that transit is only for low income people is totally blown up. And Dallas is so successful that they voted now to f tax themselves for several hundred million dollars to double the network of light rail transit. And now they did not notice, no, there was never a case that one of those people stole a television set and used light rail to escape it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, here are some pictures. The, just a bus lane in the street is the first step of slightly improving buses, with minimal. And then Ottawa was one of the first with really a good BRT. They have uh, lines with rights of way separated and, and stations with uh, and even land use coordination and so on. Ottawa is now reaching its capacity or exceeded capacity. They're building light rail through center city to provide more capacity by long light rail trains. Uh, so they will continue then, I'm sure, with light rail and some of these buses. In uh, Florida, they had a busway, but 
they had a, a signal priority, they had one or two accidents and they said, no, we cannot have priority and gave up on it. So we don't always have support of the traffic engineering and so on. This is in Sao Paulo where they have hundreds of buses per hour and trolley buses and they build, they open this before they have time to build metro. Metro will be built, but this is faster solution for now. In Lima, Peru, it was uh, one of the early separate busways. Then they deregulated transit and allowed, allowed uh, uh, jitneys and so on and destroyed this concept. Uh, so that happens also sometimes. And then there was a test of a guided bus, which uh, when that was invented you know, around 1980, they said, we don't need rail vehicles anymore. Now we have guided buses. Well, it was built in Adelaide in Australia. It has some advantages, but many disadvantages. The guideway is more, more uh, complex and so on, and has not been built uh, really. It, it did not catch on. It, it doesn't have enough advantages over regular buses. These are now typical BRTs on the streets, and in uh, Bogota is particularly famous one, which has mostly double lanes in the stations uh, to increase capacity. Now you do notice that. Uh, that the, uh, the pollution is there, a uh, problem. This is in Istanbul, this is in Los Angeles, where uh, the capacity at intersections is reached because you get two buses and not more, and then we're limited about five, 6,000 persons per hour. In Boston, uh, it's disastrous. I don't want to waste my time, but <laughs> they spent half a billion dollars on less than a mile of tunnel. And then they, and the, that is BRT going to the airport, goes on the street, then in the tunnel, and then in, to the airport. And then when they open it up, they notice that when you have a curve in the tunnel, with rail, you have signals. And when it's green, you can go, you know it's safe. With a bus, you have to see what's going on there. The driver doesn't see it, so they're down to 10 kilometers per hour. You don't spend half a billion dollars for a tunnel and then use a vehicle without safety and, and so on. So that was not a very good example. Trolley buses in many cities are still successful in very good mode. This is uh, the Curitiba, very successful and coordinated with the city development and so on. And this is Curitiba also. And now, why Bogota is so successful with BRT is because they really didn't have any decent transit. They had these eight meter long buses which broke down very often. And they, the city of which was six million and growing didn't have any decent transit service. So when they built this BRT, they got crowds. So they managed to get this special lane. These two buses carry more than in all these cars that you can see. Now, the stations are still not very pedestrian friendly. You have to walk from the station up and over and down and so on. And, uh, and then they say, you see, you have high capacity. Well, when you have this kind of congestion, that's not high capacity, that's really beyond capacity when you really have very slow and inefficient buses. So some BRTs that are very successful are really first candidates to convert to rail. So there is a slot for BRT, and then, then it should go for rail for higher capacity. They had some uh, maintenance uh, problems there and air pollution problems. And then you see that this is the busway in Bogota, and you see how it separates the city, really. Uh, divides the city, so pedestrians have to go over and down and so on. It doesn't unify the city. Now let's see light rail. This was first modern, long articulated train. Still running on the streets, but then as they began to separate, this is the right of way B separated, and then in center city, they built a tunnel. So the same train goes through all these different alignments and gradually they uh, separated piece by piece. The typical case is that we had many bus lines from many directions converging towards center city. And then you take this main line and convert it into rail, and then you have bus feeders. So you do have transfers, <coughs> but yet 
This is not theory. Here is Sacramento. This is what they had here with the, with the uh, bus lines, all these bus lines. And they converted to light rail and made transfers. And from here to here, 30% more riders. So this is the typical upgrading from BRT to light rail. In light rail, we went from old-fashioned tramways with uh, trailers and so on, and with uh, a lot of labor. We have, uh, in the first case, we have the driver and three conductors, and then fewer conductors, and then no conductors in self-service. And then, uh, then we began to have these even longer trains. So some cities have up to four cars in, in a train, like uh, like uh, uh, San Diego and uh, some others. Um, this is Portland, Oregon, which redesigned downtown beautifully and improved it for pedestrians and cars and transit. And this is how, in many cities, the center city is really uh, strengthened by light rail. And this is totally contrary to that busway in Bogota, which separates the city this one really puts it, makes it a lively city in downtown area. Yeah, you see, this is a BRT and this is a LRT. San Diego, St. Louis, uh, green areas are very popular. They are very environmentally acceptable. This is in French cities. By the way, French cities which gave up now are building many, many, many new light rail systems. About 25 cities now in France have new uh, light rail systems. Uh, England has several, Spain has about 25 also. So we really have a wave of uh, light rail coming into large, and then even the large city, even Paris, which said we have metro and bus and that's it, two modes and most efficient. Paris is now building many more lines of light rail transit, mostly in suburban connecting areas, than the metro. Uh, suburban lines by light rail are also being, have been built in London, even in New York, Hoboken line, and so on. Vienna, Vienna has a good subway system and one of the largest light rail or tramway systems in the world. Very spacious very quiet, very attractive. And then it goes into the core area on the street. And then some cities build this tram train. This is a train in downtown where they did not have separate right of way, but then it goes on a railway line and goes to 50 kilometers out even to, from uh, Germany to France. Uh, this is now uh, a city Bergen in Norway, uh, which is about uh, 250,000 or with surrounding some of more and so on. But really many people say, oh, it's too small for light rail and so on. Well, they began about 15 years ago to discuss light rail. They organized how to design it and how to finance it through some, some of the tolls and some other funds and so on and they decided to build it, and they built a line about 20 kilometers long in slightly more than two years. It's fantastic, and they, in Norway, they build tunnels very well. They have four short tunnels along that line. They have uh, signal priority at every intersection. Uh, and I was asking, do you have support of the, of the people in the city? Oh, most people don't know what it is, and some of them are saying, oh, it'll affect my parking here, and with this and this complaints. Now, ridership is way up, and they're discussing where should the next lines go. It's, a, it's an absolute success. I should admit that that uh, was also designed and, and pushed, the whole project was pushed by one of my former students. <laughs> <laughs> so, I... If I may, I'll take some credit. <laughs> <laughs> because I have, uh, I have all these uh, alumni, and now I have here, I see my academic grandchildren. They're, they're students. <laughs> we'll keep going. We'll keep going. Uh, look at this. It's beautiful, really beautiful system. It's a very 
very quiet, very popular, and uh, simple as, as, as uh, you know, no, no complexity. The price was good, and I mean, investment cost. And they're extending it now to the airport. They have plans for further ones. So this is this one has a lot of elements that really are similar to what you should be expecting to have higher speed sections and lower speed sections and going through streets and so on. And, and a lot of snow, you know, Norway and you have that similarity also. This is in uh, Dublin, in Ireland, a new line that was built. This one has seven sections. This is a busier line. And it goes a little bit through center city, but then it has right of way uh, mostly separated some sections are without any crossings right away, A, so very high speed. So, comparison of light rail and BRT. Light rail has a stronger image. It is popular and attracts more riders. It has greater capacity and higher operating speed. It has better vehicle performance and quality of ride. Electric traction is much better. Vehicles are more spacious and comfortable. Uh, much easier provision and protection of separate rights of way. That's, the, that's one point that's so important. That when we have tracks separated, there are no council people who can tell me we can allow these emergency vehicles and trucks and, uh, and bicycles and whatever. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a big difference. Um, and it's acceptable, not only acceptable, but very attractive in pedestrian streets and zones. Because of electric propulsion, it has no exhaust at all in place. Uh, it has much less noise and it can use tunnels. Bus rapid transit has been used in some tunnels, but in most cases, not very successfully. Like Boston is really bad. And the, <laughs> and the tunnels have to be very wide. Well, Seattle built one at a very high cost. And uh, again, it's... Uh, it's uh, you need much bigger profile and, uh, and you have to change, make a bimodal vehicle and so on. Um, so also, uh, light rail has a much stronger positive impact on urban development. That is very important. And it's permanent. It's not dependent on police enforcement, on political or civic, or civic leaders and judges and so on. Um, Disadvantages of light rail compared to BRT. It's usually higher investment costs, sometimes drastically so, sometimes not. If you build a bus tunnel, it will cost you more than light rail. But, uh, but uh, in most cases, LRT is more investment. Uh, but it is lower, it is lower operating cost because the, uh, one driver carries a, a lot more longer train and so on. In developing countries, that is not so important because they're labor cheap. In our case, uh, light rail would uh, involve a much lower invest, uh, operating cost. Then, it, uh, light rail introduces new technology and requires special facilities. So you do have to get more different, different garages, different types of mechanics, and so on. It's more complicated in that respect. And then, of course, light rail is limited to track network and so it has more transfers from feeders. So you see you have some advantages, some disadvantages. Okay, let's go a little bit through automated guided transit. In some, some modern systems, guided systems, uh, the automation is possible and if you have totally separated right away, right away A, like this one, Val in France, you can operate them completely without, without the driver. That Val is uh, very successful in the city of Lille, but the car is designed very badly. They wanted to save on the tunnel width and made a very tight car on the inside, so its capacity is rather small. You see, this is, this is the Val, and this is light rail, much wider. Uh, this is the station. Uh, we have dozens of such systems in the airports, and they're very good for shuttle. They're the best solution in many airports. In uh, Miami, one such distributor was built for center city distribution of rapid transit. So this is rapid transit up on the upper level, 
and then you go to the uh, AGT, which then pro takes you to about 16 stations in downtown, which Metro really could never make. It would be too complicated for many stations and so on. Uh, this is the uh, Vancouver, the first version of that. And uh, Vancouver has three minute headways or intervals from morning to nine in the evening because it's cheap to operate automatically. So it's, it's an excellent example of a good system. They built then the Canada line, which is completely different technology. In my, my opinion, big mistake. You do not build totally different incompatible systems in the same city. Uh, personal rapid transit. How many of you have heard about personal rapid transit? Some of you, yes. But personal rapid transit is a theoretical concept developed nearly 50 years ago. And I've had some colleagues, some university professors, who were saying that is the absolute solution. And I claim that that is a system that's not feasible under any conditions. Uh, PRT is supposed to be cabins where you enter the cabin with only a single party, two, three, up to four persons, and then you push a button and it takes you on a special guideway where wherever you want to go. That has been discussed and the whole city would have all these uh, guideways and so on. When you try to design that for any given city, you see that that is physically impossible. You would have two intersections, uh, one street and another street. They would have to be at two levels. And then you would have to connect them. You would have to have the whole interchange up there, which neither you can nor would you build that in center city downtown. So the promoters finally gave up on that, but they kept, they were proposing in Chicago feeders for suburban station for their regional transit authority. They spent about $40 billion, I think, on that, and eventually they canceled it because they saw it's not realistic. Uh, if you would have a successful PRT, you would immediately see that AGT is better than larger vehicles which would make a few stops, but be many times cheaper and much easier to operate. So PRT is not possible uh, uh, because it doesn't have enough capacity for many people in downtown, or in suburbs where there's low density, it would be too expensive to build for so few riders. I, uh, I sometimes say that uh, this concept of personal rapid transit is like a proposal to take a centipede and cross it with a sow in order to have 100 hands. <laughs> the two concepts of small vehicle and expensive guideway and electronics, they just don't go together. So why am I spending my time on that? Because after 40 years, no system built. Several years ago, there was a new flood now they call them pods, I think. They gave it a different name. They usually come to political leaders in the city, not taxpayers. And they convinced them that this could be done. They came to Ithaca, New York, and proposed for $100 million to have all these things going all over. The problem is that many cities got confused and the decision and progress did got delayed by many years because of these unrealistic proposals. And they are now going to Abu Dhabi and some others, and again, to finding people who don't understand and really creating a problem. So I'm, I'm just telling you, be careful if they come to tell you, ask them questions to show how it does not work. Uh, this was the first one shown in uh, Washington as a prototype. Absolute nuisance. You had to wait for <laughs> half an hour to get from one place to another and so on. Uh, this is now built to bring people from parking lot in uh, London Heathrow to the terminal. And they, they have this supposedly from anywhere to anywhere. It goes only from one point in the terminal to about two or three points in the parking lot. And they spend tens of millions of dollars instead of improving those buses between terminals in London where you spend so much time. So, and these are theoretically how they would go. Then we have monorails, which are very attractive, and uh, this is 
over 100 years old and works well over a river in Germany. But then the most common ones are these straddling ones, which exist in many Japanese cities. And physically, they can work. They're, there's no problem. They can work, only they are, the guideway is more complicated. Uh, they still have to be in the air, and the idea is that if it's in the air, it can go anywhere. Well, it's the same problem as if you have rail system elevated in city streets. So, it, there are some systems, and it's not impossible, I'm not saying that should not exist, I just exist to say that in most cases rail is distinctly a better solution. So, uh, this is the uh, uh, review of some comments on this AGT, which also is operational, and uh, the, between light rail and the metro system is this a light rail which is fully separated and can be automated. I don't think that's a candidate for your case here. You need one that is uh, close to many developments and can go through your area. I'm just showing it here for some special cases. Uh, so AGT would be too complicated and too, uh, too expensive for you. And then uh, the uh, between light rail and uh, bus improvements, there are pluses and minuses, and uh, as I discussed before, it depends on the situation, and uh, the buses and rail should not be considered as competitors and en enemies if you are building any rail transit system in the world. If you neglect buses or connection with other rail, you're, you are wasting a lot of your effort. You need coordination of rail with other modes, everything from uh, car, bus and ride, and, uh, taxi and, and buses and so on, to, uh, to regional rail like GO Transit and so on. So you need intermodal approach, you need coordination among modes, and that is when you will uh, get full benefit. Our uh, future transportation of the future is intermodal. So we are talking about here unifying transit systems. On the other hand, the bigger the, uh, your project, which I think is light rail, is will be excellent. It will have a positive impact on the whole region and connect and uh, 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 create more efficiency among your three cities, which are growing together anyway. But they'll be growing more orderly and more efficiently with that system, and that will be the skeleton. And that skeleton usually attract so many people to, to transit that even the bus ridership, all of these buses on this line mostly go to rail, bus ridership on the others increases. So many cities have increased bus ridership also when light rail was built. And then, of course, underlying all that should be your policies looking at the system and how people behave and what do we do, how do we get people to uh, transfer more to uh, to transit. Where is the bicycle as a mode? What about pedestrians? Uh, in your case, even uh, and I think Toronto has used that with your climate, you should see the stations and connections with the buildings in the surroundings, and some uh, contribution to financing of stations. Washington has done that in many stations that buildings around it contribute to the uh, underground passages and connections and so on. So that is the big picture in which you are. And uh, so that is the, uh, this is your light rail, and this is the Dallas, where they say they will never ride that kind of vehicle, and now they are enthusiastically riding it and going 100 kilometers per hour. So that's the review of the medium capacity modes, and uh, you are, as far as I've seen in these three days, you are approaching it from the policy point of view and, and system design and, uh, and system integration, and that's what you should continue. I wish you could work on that. Thank you. And last night I had a chance to have dinner with Dr. Burkich and uh, his lovely wife, and my invitation to Boston is hereby rescinded. Uh, <laughs> Brad can come anytime she likes. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to raise a, a, a minor uh, 
question. There's a lot of discussion in the uh, transit industry about uh, modern streetcar and light rail. And uh, folks like to differentiate between, between the two as a practitioner. I don't see much difference, quite frankly. And I wanted to get your opinion on streetcar, modern streetcar, vis-a-vis -vis light rail. Well, it's very interesting. Many of us who were really promoting light rail, we did expect that there will be a lot of light rail investments and so on. We did not quite expect that there would be a, a major revival of really streetcars, which are, have a different role in many cities. They are more kind of a, a, a shuttle between living within two, three kilometers and connecting and distributing, or even, you know, the problem with a car, if you park at one place and you go to another one, you have to go back to your car, and the car is inconvenient for these short trips. If you have this shuttle, that helps. So it has a functional role, but by no means capacity and speed and all that. A light rail requires speed and reliability. It's a totally different role. In some cities, though, you, you, uh, you have light rail, and you make it compatible with, uh, with the streetcar, and, uh, and uh, uh, you add streetcar as a, because of its image. And it gives image, and like in, in uh, San Jose, California, they have a loop downtown, and light rail keeps going, and one streetcar is running around, and people love it, and various, uh, I don't know if they have weddings on it, but uh, there are many, many other functions. It's interesting that it's not only one city, but there are now 15, 20 cities which are doing that. Justification of that really is not on the transportation aspect, as it is more of image of downtown and so on. But the two can overlap by using some facilities. Thank you. Other questions? Space for right of way for tracks, or, 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 well, just, or if there is a potential and good, good. Because you're, you're talking about Dallas, where they had um, existing lines, and now that they're looking at expanding those lines, so are they putting in new policies in their planning uh, programs to to take that into consideration? Like if you're, you know, we, we spoke in the beginning of the, the whole talk about the marriage of planning and engineering. Yeah, well, they really. That really depends on uh, many things. One is the topography. Is there is there development of a, that corridor continuing in the north, in the south, or is some of the branches such that you would like uh, it would make sense to do that? And then the second is uh, uh, what what kind of uh, what type of city you want to plan. And that is another one. And then. Then, of course, physically, you know, the cost of investment can be extremely expensive. You have to build a bridge and tunnel, but it can be very cheap if you just have uh, right away on the surface. So it will depend on the uh, shape of the city you want and you want to encourage, on the geography and topography, and on the cost of operation. And uh, if you expect to have X number of passengers, and you have 10% uh, less, you will be a little bit more cautious. If you have 30% more, you will speed up the, the next step. So your reaction to it uh, varies, and in, uh, in most cases, I think that we've had more riders than expected, but it's, uh, you, you still want to see how our models for demand projection, how, how exact they were, and, uh, and then check whether such extension would be feasible. Do you find that you get a lot more um, involvement with when you're looking at um, redevelopments or the areas of an older part of a city? Do you get them that marriage between the two different uh, yeah. Yeah. 
I, I certainly think that uh, if if there is some potential for redevelopment or de new, new development, that you should uh, uh, you should uh, look at the potential of extending this, or you may get sometimes an additional station in the middle somewhere where there is nothing now. There is there is a piece of land where there is development potential. So you would just depends on the on the local conditions and geography. Um, I, I was just going to add to that as well. The, uh, my own experience has been in Dallas and Salt Lake City are probably good, two good examples of a intentionally trying to shape the community as opposed to managing out of uh, congestion and chaos, I would call it. So I think it really depends on that local response as well. Um, so with that, I think we're going to wrap up and, and um, uh, as you're all the academic grandchildren, my, my own personal commitment is not to be your academically misguided nephew. <laughs> so we will do our very, very best, but I do want to say this is such a privilege to have you here and have you speak with us, and we have a very small token of appreciation. And thank you so much, and please don't be a visitor, be a friend, and part of our family. Thank you.